you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2. As you're turning there, it's important to remember and, and worth knowing that uh, through the first chapter of Proverbs, Solomon, the wise sage, has invited his sons and his hearers uh, to heed, to hear and to heed uh, this path of wisdom and godliness. He's not only invited them to hear this path of wisdom, but he has also warned about refusing to walk this path of wisdom. So we heard the invite in chapter 1, verse 8, the first invite. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. There's the invitation, the first one. And then we hear the warning of refusing this path in verse 24. Because I've called, you refuse to listen. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way. They shall have the fill of their own devices. There's the warning. So chapter 1 has an invitation to know wisdom. It has a warning of refusing this wisdom. But now, as we move into chapter 2, the actual search for wisdom is to begin. So Proverbs 2 is a call to people to begin the search, to seek after this godly path. And there's a very clear reason why, because down this path are hidden treasures. That's what he compares this wisdom and godly path to. Things like silver, gold, hidden treasures. Things that are of tremendous worth. And there's great insight there into the nature of Christian living. As believers, we are to be people who are seeking, pursuing, going after, and therefore discovering worthy and wonderful things. This is the path and process Jesus calls us to in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you'll find. Knock, the door will be opened to you. But what we discover in this search are not only these hidden treasures of wisdom. Down this path, you discover more about yourself. You discover the tremendous treasure you are to this God who would reveal himself to you, who would make known this path to you. We discover a path that leads to our very formation as believers. So let's hear the call here in Proverbs 2 to search after God and his ways. Chapter 2 in its entirety. Listen now to God's word. My son, if you receive my words... And treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart. Knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Delivering you from the way of evil from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil, who delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. You will also be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. Note the first verse of this chapter. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you. This is the second appeal in the book. 
The second appeal to consider this way and this path of wisdom and godliness. There are, I think, ten appeals in the first nine chapters. The first came in chapter 1, verse 8. I've already noted it. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. But notice the progression now, even to the second appeal. The first is, listen, or hear, my son. But now, the appeal is, receive. Now, accept these things. From hearing and listening to receiving and accepting this. And this is a very helpful passage in the Bible, this whole chapter, because it explains how we grow in the grace of the Lord, what it looks like to be growing, what it feels like to be growing. And part of the power of this chapter comes through its particular form and structure. It's actually one long sentence in Hebrew, one long sentence, which communicates it has a unified message. It has a unified message, different parts to it, but one whole message. Additionally, you'll notice it has 22 verses or 22 lines, the same number of letters in the Hebrew language. It's a, it's a device. It's a literary device used to communicate this sense of completeness and wholeness to this message. We see that in other parts of Proverbs and in other parts of the Bible. Psalm 119, that really long psalm, all about the precepts and the commandments of God. It's broken out into 22 sections corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrew language or alphabet. So it's a whole, complete message describing the path, how we grow in grace, and what are the benefits that follow from it. And the first thing to see in these opening 11 verses describing the path of growth in God's grace and wisdom is that growth is the result, in part, of desire. Growth in the grace of God is, in part, the result of desire. So the father, the the wise sage, is seeking to awaken desire in this young man. You can see it. You can feel it in the language. Eliciting desire. My son, if you receive my words, if you treasure up my commands, if you make your ear attentive, if you incline your heart, yes, if you call out for insight, raise your voice for understanding, seek it like silver, search for it as for hidden treasures. Raise your voice for understanding. Remember Lady Wisdom Last week in chapter 1, verse 20, as she was at the city gates and in the markets calling out, trying to get people's attention about this path of wisdom and godliness. And now the young man is being called by his father to raise his voice. It's a picture communicating the need to have a longing for God and his ways. You can see it and feel it in all the verbs. Receiving. Treasuring up, being attentive, inclining our heart, calling out, raising our voice, seeking, searching, all of these actions. They're all communicating the need to have a desire, a longing for God. And there's great insight here into, I think, our human nature, our human psyche as people in general. People are by nature creatures who have desires. It's not that some people have desires and some people don't have desires. It's what it is that we are desiring and wanting. And Solomon is seeking to awaken desire for that which satisfies in life. In order to deliver people and to deliver us from that which destroys. And he's revealing very much the character of our God. We see it by what God offers and gives to those who do desire. God offers much to his people. And what God offers is not what the world offers. Our culture all around us is seeking to offer and sell us. I think its most important product that it's seeking to sell is you. 
the interests, the exaltation, the glory of self is the culture's aim. We see it all around. We feel it. You can see it in things like company slogans. Have it your way. Famous burger chain. L'Oreal. Because you're worth it. I was looking up these slogans and I came across El Oreal. El Oreal. Oh, L'Oreal. Unfamiliar. You're worth it. Or the breakfast of champions. Eat this, you're a champion. Uh, Just recently, a triathlon sports organization I'm familiar with rebranded itself, and it was informing those participating in it, that it has a new name, Alpha One, Alpha One, where every man and woman can be an alpha male or an alpha female. It's all about the glory and the exaltation of self. But it's not going to satisfy. Man was not designed to serve himself as the chief end. And here in these opening verses, God in his gracious wisdom is offering something much greater than ourselves. Our interests, our pursuits, our own passions. This is like silver and gold. This is like hidden treasures. Do we believe that? This is what Jesus taught, the kingdom of God. The gospel is like treasure hidden in a field. At which a man will sell all that he has... And in his joy, purchase that field to ensure that he has it, that he will possess it. What God is offering is not just of infinite worth, his words, his wisdom, himself. But when these things are treasured, when he is treasured, we not only gain him, but we are satisfied as his people. There's joy and pleasure in the soul. And among the things that God grants for those who are longing after him, desiring him, is pleasure, delight. You see it in verse 10. This wisdom, he says, is going to come into your heart. Now you've got a very close relationship between uh, God, his wisdom, and the young man. And this knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. It's going to come into your heart and be pleasant to your soul. Two important words, heart and soul. The word heart is used over 40 times through Proverbs. It's it's what controls the body. It's what gives our countenance, our facial expression. It's what controls the tongue, all the members of our body. That's the heart. Bruce Waltke says it's the most important term related to the person in the Old Testament. But then you have the word soul. This is different. It's not referring to the seat or center of one's life. This here, this soul, is referring to the passionate drives and appetites of not only people, all breathing creatures. The soul. Appetite for food. Appetite for intimacy. Notice what happens when this wisdom, this aspect of God, gets into a person's heart. It fulfills, it satisfies, it pleases the soul. Really, our our deepest longing, our deepest appetite for life. Once again, Proverbs points us to the wisdom found in Jesus Christ himself. Remember our Lord's words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. What a wonderful God would offer to his people not only a righteous and holy path, but a path that brings pleasure, that brings delight. God's after that in our lives. Notice one other literary structure here. It's the if-then statements in these opening verses. Verse 1, if you receive my words. Verse 3, if you call out for insight. Verse 4, if you seek. And then what follows? Verse 5, then you will understand. Verse 9, then you will grasp righteousness and justice. 
I think these if-then statements, among other things, are a way of saying this path, this investment has huge rewards and dividends. Invest in this. God is good for this. It will be rewarding. We're constantly investing as people. Investing our money, investing in relationships, perhaps investing in real estate. There's no return in this world. There's no return or dividend that will come to us that will result in this, this desire and longing for God. Nothing that will result like this. But then you have that word if. This is the way uh, the Father is communicating. This is not natural. This is not natural for us. It's not our default setting. You don't drift in this direction. And so the wise sage, he's causing the son and all of us to ask the question, what do you want? Have you asked that of yourself recently? What are you wanting in life? What do you desire? In his book, Seen with New Eyes, David Pallison, Christian author and counselor, says the question, what do you want, is the easy part. We might say at least easier. The harder question is to ask, why do you want what you want? Why do you want what you want? And he makes two points. One, our hearts, our lives are a battleground for competing desires. This is where biblical Christianity sits alone in answering that question. Our heart is a battleground, competing desires. Two, God is able to rewire or reorder our desires. He's actually able to change what it is that we are wanting. This is what happens when Fundamentally, a person is born anew, born again, as Jesus teaches in John 3. Or when Paul speaks about being transformed by the renewing of our minds. New desires actually flow into the heart of a person. But there's a little bit of a twist. Because our Lord not only calls us to have desires for good and godly things, but to have our desires ordered after him. Sometimes what we desire is simply and clearly sin and evil, coveting, stealing, sexual sin. But sometimes a desire for a good and godly thing becomes sinful out of order because it becomes a ruling thing, a master in our lives. I think this is very important as we think about our desires. John Calvin called these inordinate Desires, excessive, unwarranted. The desire for a good thing, a godly thing, becoming a bad or sinful thing because it has become a ruling thing. It's gotten out of place. This happens when my service to the Lord becomes my primary identity. When my love of my spouse or family begins to replace or usurp my love of God. Uh, When my devotion and study about God begins to outdo my love of God himself. They're all good things, but they're getting out of place and out of order. There can be a natural tendency to think, as long as I love all the right and godly things, I'll have peace, I'll be in the good. But not so. God's worth is so great, it calls for our greatest and our highest affection and devotion and love. He alone is to have that place. As the psalmist says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire like you. And that's what the wise sage here is wanting to stir up in the heart. God calls and desires for us to long for him above all else. 
he's interested in that. Not only for his own glory, but for our joy and pleasure. The glory of God, the pleasure and joy of his people. It's the very purpose for which he created all things. And this was at the very heart of Jonathan Edwards' vision. It's what's stated in our catechism opening question. Edwards put it this way, from the fountain of revealed truth, God demonstrates that the chief, the ultimate end of the supreme being is the manifestation of his own glory in the highest happiness of his creatures. What a marvelous category in thought. We are most joyful, happy, satisfied when we are magnifying the glory of God. And God is able to give us new desires for him in this way. Kind of a new taste for his word, his ways, his presence. So if I need to be growing in being a more loving husband or wife, if I need to be more gracious with those around me, my coworkers, if I need help overcoming complacency, we don't need the easy three or four or five steps. First and foremost, we need a new desire, a new longing, a renewed heart for God. And the life that desires God and treasures this path is a life that experiences deliverance and protection in this world. And that's the flow of chapter 2. As we walk down this path, as we long for God, as we seek Him, He protects us. He delivers us. And there's two things mentioned, two evil paths in Proverbs 2 from which we are delivered. One is from men of perverted speech. The other is from the forbidden woman. The first is verses 12 to 15. The second is verses 16 to 19. They have a lot in common, actually. They're both marked by the word deliverance or to be delivered from, verse 12 and 16. Uh, they both use the image of a path. Verse 12 You'll be delivered from the way of evil, from those walking in the ways of darkness. Verse 18, her house sinks down to death, her paths to the departed. They also both misuse words, involve the misuse of words. Men of perverted speech, the women with her smooth words. And in both, the man needs to be delivered, protected. Consider the first one, men of perverted speech. These words, perverted speech, they're, they're not referring to the mere use of bad words or profanities. They're rather carrying the idea of distorting or twisting words. Behind the word actually means, up, is the idea of upheaval, upheaval, turning something upside down. Words have meaning. They are to be used to represent something true, real, to represent reality. These men pervert, they distort, and they twist words in order to twist reality. People will do this, sometimes unaware, misrepresenting the way things actually are. People will twist uh, the meaning and the name of Jesus Christ perhaps to fit a social agenda. People will twist the word family to redefine it, to fit a cultural expectation. Outside of life in God, people are left to use or to twist words to fit what they believe to be reality. But those who receive God's wisdom, verse 9, they will understand righteousness, justice, equity. They will be delivered from the distortion or twisting of the way things actually are. It's a significant claim coming from Scripture. Having, in a way, a, the right perspective, a monopoly on the way things are in this world, on reality. 
Then there's a second deliverance, verse 16. Deliverance from the forbidden woman with her, sm- with her smooth words. It says of her, she forsakes the companion of her youth. It's, this is revealing that this is a married woman. And like the men who are crooked and deceiving in their speech, she's deceptive and crooked. She is herself deceived. She's seeking fulfillment and is enticing others to that which cannot fulfill. It's only going to bring pain and destruction. How many have fallen into such sin? And the pain that it brings to oneself, to those around them. Yet, the wisdom, the ways of God, not only protect from sin... His way is the only way that leads to forgiveness from sin, healing and restoration. Hope, hope beyond sin, new desires for him. I think it was Thomas Watson, the Puritan, who spoke about the expulsive powers of a new affection. New desires and new affections sort of flooding our hearts. And that's how we grow in grace. In the path of sanctification. And so he provides these concluding words in verse 20. So you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will inhabit the land. I think inhabiting the land is is Old Testament language for abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Abiding in the Lord. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. Might we treasure Christ? He is our wisdom. Would we raise our voice and call out to him? Ray Ortland says this, however we are suffering, whatever we are struggling with, our real business is with Christ. He is saying to us here in his word, come to me, deal with me. I'm able to restore you out of your past failings and defend you for the future. Hurl yourself at me in all your need. I will give myself to you in all my grace. My wisdom will come into your heart in ways you've never known before. Will you come to Christ today? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how we give praise and thanks for your son who is our wisdom, wisdom from you. We thank you, O God, for the glorious life and path of sanctification. Lord, by your mercy that you have set us upon this good and godly path. We pray, O Lord, most of all, that you would grant to us a deep, ever-deepening passion and desire for you. To worship you, to serve you, to love you. That you would have that primary, that first, that greatest place in our lives that you would receive glory, Lord, and that we would be filled with joy in our hearts and that gratitude would overflow, that gratitude and thanksgiving would be the result. We pray, Lord, that you would um, surround us with your grace in the midst of um, the trials and the temptations, the, the evil paths that are Uh, presented before us, represented in many ways within our culture. And Lord, we have hearts that compete with these various desires. Lord, flood us with new affections for you and for your word. Uh, Renew our hearts today and we will give you praise. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.